بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد Respects and listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Whoever is protected from the avarice of his soul, then these are the ones who are successful. To be successful and true success is the success of the spirit, the success of one's religion and success with Allah. That will be crowned as success in the afterlife. That is the true success. So to be successful, Allah has laid down a rule. That only those who are protected from the greed, from the avarice and the covetousness of their soul, these are the ones who are successful. As long as a person's soul is diseased with the illness of greed, selfishness, self-concern, then that individual can never be successful. Maybe in the world, yes, but in terms of true spirit, bliss, and in terms of the afterlife, such a person can never be successful. Selfishness and greed go hand in hand. A person is selfish because of greed. A person is greedy because of selfishness. Allah has created human beings in such a way that they share some characteristics of the animals, as well as some of the characteristics of the angels. Allah has created animals in such a way that they never rise above their station. They are as they are. And Allah has created angels at the other end of the spectrum in such a way that they don't change either. They are as they are. There is no concept of the fallen angels in Islam. Allah says of the angels, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون The angels do not disobey Allah in what he has commanded them to do. Rather, they do as they are instructed. So there is no concept of a fallen angel in Islam. Angels are faithful, loyal, devoted obedient servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are as they are. They undergo no change. And there are a number of reasons for that. The angels have been endowed with enlightenment, with 
enlightened intelligence, with higher intelligence, with light, with nur. Allah has made them as they are. They have been created to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill one purpose. Every angel is instructed to do something. And that angel devotes himself and focuses himself only on that one instruction of Allah. Fulfilling that commandment continuously for eternity. They do not disobey Allah. And owing to their nature, Allah has saved them from and Allah has spared them the lower necessities of the animals. Angels have no need for nourishment, for food, drink, rest, recuperation. They are never afflicted by hunger or thirst or illness or disease. They undergo no change in their temperament, in their nature. They are as they are, constant and constantly obeying and serving Allah and enlightened and pure. They suffer no physical impurity or weakness or decline or shortcoming just as they do not suffer any spiritual fault, disease, shortcoming, or loss in any way. They are complete. At the other end, Allah has created the animals. But the animals have not been endowed with high intelligence, with light, with enlightenment. Rather, the angels, the, the animals, have been created from the soil of the earth. They are earthly, they are lowly. And they are full of weaknesses, flaws and shortcomings. They are full of physical and mental and spiritual imperfections. Allah has burdened the animals with the need for food, drink, rest, recuperation, recovery. Animals are afflicted by disease, by hunger, thirst, weakness, decline and deterioration, mainly physical. And animals are never in a constant state, being of this world and of this universe, they are forever changing. And that change is not necessarily better, rather it's one of decline and deterioration. But just like the angels, the animals, the animals do not undergo any change. They are meaning they cannot change for the better. They are as they are. They have no potential to overcome these animalistic tendencies and bestial weaknesses. So here we have the angels full of angelic qualities. And on the other hand, we have the animals full of lowly bestial characteristics. In between, Allah created as humans. We share many characteristics of the, of the animals, but also some characteristics of the angels. Like the angels, Allah has created us for a higher purpose, to serve him, to worship him, to devote ourselves to him, to obey him, and most importantly, to serve him, to be his ibad, which doesn't just mean to be his worshippers, rather to be his servants, and to serve him for every breathing moment, for every living moment of our existence. And Allah has endowed us with higher intelligence, with cognition, with thinking, unique thinking, with unique emotions, and with spirituality. Allah has instilled us with light and with nur. But at the same time, Allah in his wisdom has instilled in us many characteristics of the animals and their weaknesses. The need for food, drink, rest, recuperation, recovery. The problem of being afflicted by hunger, thirst, fatigue, disease, illness, decline, weakness. But unlike the angels and the animals, 
Humans are unique in the sense that they have great capacity in them, they have a great potential in them to change. They are never as they are. So they can, through their choices, Allah has given us a choice, and through those choices, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the opportunity to choose to either remain like the animals or become worse than them, or to rise to the heights of spirituality and adopt the qualities and the characteristics of the angels. So much so that if a person rises to that level, Allah even boasts of the angels, of humans in the presence and in the company of the angels. And Allah mentions the believers in that lofty company. <coughs> and being of animalistic tendencies, being walking, talking animals ourselves, and sharing those bestial characteristics, the chief one, or one of the main ones, is the bestial instinct, the animalistic instinct to survive. And that desire, that need, that instinct, that primordial instinct of survival drives animals to behave in a certain way. Animals are selfish, self-serving, concerned only with themselves, and are blinded. They don't have that higher intelligence. They are blinded by the need to survive themselves. That drives them to kill, to trample on others, to feed themselves and gorge on the carcasses of others, and to destroy anything and anyone in their path in order to get what they want. If they need food, they will trample on and destroy anything and everything in order to get that food, to fulfill that immediate need. And this is born out of that instinct for survival. And human beings, being animals, we have the same tendency. Our selfishness, our primordial instinct for survival, drives us to behave in extremely selfish, egocentric ways. But, in many ways, we are worse than the animals. The animal, whilst being selfish, often does it without malice. It doesn't harbour emotion whilst doing it. Nor does it hoard and gather and accumulate for the future. Nor does it plan in the long term. We as humans, not only are we selfish, but coupled with our selfishness, we plan to be selfish for the rest of our lives. We we harbour emotions along with our selfishness. When we are selfish, we don't just do it for survival. We do it out of malice, out of hatred, harbouring resentment. And so in many ways, our selfishness is of a worse kind than that of the animals. We are greedy, and there's a difference. Animals aren't greedy, they are selfish. But their desire for selfishness ends the moment their immediate need is fulfilled. Human beings, as humans, we are selfish, but the moment our immediate need is satisfied, our selfishness doesn't come to an end. It then develops into greed. So we think for the future, okay, I've had enough food for now, but we plan ahead. As Allah says, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهُ Nay, man intends to sin ahead of himself. Meaning, man doesn't just sin now. Rather, man actually plans his sins for the future. He wishes to disobey Allah ahead of himself. So he actually plans and think, this is how I will disobey Allah tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, in the future. 
And that is cynical, that is despicable. So man's selfishness is not an immediate instinctive thing like that of the animals. An animal needs to eat, it will do what it can in order to eat, trample and destroy, consume others and gorge on that flesh. But the moment it has done that, its selfishness comes to an end. But human beings, we as humans, our selfishness does not come to an end upon the satisfaction of our immediate need. Rather, we harbour future emotions. We make plans to remain selfish for the future, and that's greed. So this is why greed and selfishness go hand in hand. And that kind of extreme selfishness coupled, sorry, extreme greed coupled with selfishness is known as shuh in the Arabic language. And that's what Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Whoever is protected from the shuh, which means extreme greed, avarice, covetousness, covetousness and selfishness, only such people are successful if they are protected from that. Otherwise, this selfishness, this extreme greed, this shuh will destroy them. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu anhumah relates a hadith recorded by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad as well as others in which he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in fact more than one sahabi radiyallahu an relate the same hadith in different words in one narration ittaqu al-shuh fa inna al-shuh ahlaka man kana qablakum fear be wary of shuh Again, that extreme greed coupled with selfishness. For this shuh, it destroyed those who came before you. And then in a number of hadith, Prophet ﷺ explained how it was the root cause of many illnesses, many diseases, many sins and crimes. And he goes on to mention that beware of shuh, for it destroyed those who came before you. It led them to unlawfully consuming each other's wealth. It led them to oppressing one another, to wronging one another. It led them to committing sins. In fact, in one hadith it says, shuh, that extreme greed coupled with selfishness, led them to shedding each other's blood. And that's what it does. One tabi'i relates that he was performing tawaf, and he saw a man praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his tawaf. Tawaf is one of those occasions when a person's dua is accepted by Allah. So one can imagine the, all those needs, all those hopes and dreams that a person would see and want to be fulfilled and therefore pray for them in tawaf. So this Tabi'i, one of the successors to the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, he says that I was performing tawaf and I saw a man praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the tawaf and I could hear him. And all he kept on saying, he just kept on repeating one dua. And that dua was, Allahumma qini shuh nafsi. Allahumma qini shuh nafsi. Allahumma qini shuh nafsi. Oh Allah, protect me from the shuh of my soul. And as I've explained, shuh is extreme greed coupled with selfishness. So the Tabi'i says, I came close to him and I realized that the man was Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiyallahu an, the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So I said to him, why do you repeat the single dua? Why only this dua? Allahumma qini shuh nafsi. Though Allah protects me from the shuh, from the shuh, the avarice, of my soul. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiyallahu an said, if I am protected from the shuh of my soul, then I will not steal. And then he went on to mention other sins. I will not commit this sin. I will not do this. I will not do that. 
So just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained in the ahadith, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That whoever is protected from the greed of his soul, from the avarice of his soul, and that's extreme greed coupled with selfishness, then these are the ones who are successful. And just as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Beware of shuh, for it destroyed those who came before you. Shuh, selfishness coupled with greed, is destructive. And it's a root cause of many ills, both individual and personal, as well as social. And we see that. Unfortunately, we believe and are sometimes led to believe that selfishness is good for you. It's productive. It's helpful. It sharpens your thinking. It's a great motivator, a great driver. It's a great incentive. And there are various social philosophies in this day and age which are based on the idea of selfishness. That selfishness is what motivates industry. Selfishness and greed drive enterprise, the creation and generation of wealth, innovation, and therefore selfishness is good. Not only does, in fact, selfishness is a virtue, not just a necessity, but it's a virtue. These are all phrases that appear in many modern day social philosophies. And that's what many of us believe and we are led to believe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us that selfishness is destructive. If we believe that we are nothing but advanced primates, we are nothing but advanced animals, and that there is no life after death, in here, illa hayatuna dunya namutu wa nahya wa ma nahnu mi bin as Allah quotes in the Quran, from the pagans, at the time of the Messenger وسلم, who used to say, there is no life but this life. In here, illa hayatuna dunya, there is no life but this life. Namutu wa nahya, we die and we live. Wa ma nahna and we are not ones to be resurrected. If we believe, like they did and others do, that we have no purpose of existence, there is no greater purpose, there is no God, there is no life after death. There is only this life on earth. There is no purpose to existence. We came and we appeared by chance. And we are but animals. And just like all other animals and beasts and insects and birds, we happen to be born, we have to live, eat, drink and survive and make the most of this life. And once we die, we shall disappear without consequence, without results, without any after effects. If that's what we believe, that we are animals and we have no higher purpose and that we are no better than the other beasts and birds of the earth, then we will live like animals. If we think of ourselves as animals, we will live like beasts. And in doing so, we will be extremely selfish. And in that selfishness, we will commit every sin, every crime. We will be guilty of every lowly, bestial, animalistic behaviour. In every setting. So much so that even in family settings, even in marriage, even in friendships, we will be extremely selfish. There will be no altruism, no concern for others, no sympathy, no true love. love why true love is selfless? And how can a person truly love if they are selfish? Then it's just a game 
We express love ultimately in order to get what we want. And that's why some are of the belief that there can be no altruism. Because you take any situation, even if it's charitable, the suspicion is that we give in charity, not for altruistic, higher purposes, not with a pure motive, but in order to gain something. That gain can be immediate or deferred. It can be a monetary gain. It can be a gain of good reputation, a good name. It can be a gain of name and fame. It can be, ultimately, we are looking for currency. And currency doesn't have to be pennies and pounds. Reputation is a currency. Influence is a currency. Devotion is a currency. Loyalty from others is a currency. So we may do something, it may appear to be charitable and altruistic, but deep down our nafs is secretly and maliciously harboring a very insincere intent. And that's a form of currency, some sort of payback in the future. So even in marital settings, if we think of ourselves as animals, then we will remain selfish. There can be no true love, for true love is selfless. And how can a person love selflessly when they are selfish? When they are merely expressing love in order to gain something, to win something back. Whether it's immediate or for the future. And this is why two people live together in marriage. They appear to be devoted to each other. They make claims of love and devotion to one another. And yet, when they fall out, when they disagree, everything disappears. They fight like animals over the smallest of things. I've explained the iron factor. Divorce lawyers in the US have a famous phrase in the industry of the iron factor. And what they refer to is that when they deal with divorce cases, and there are so many, the husband and wife divorce, they sign the legal papers, they agree on the distribution of wealth, on the custody of the children, visiting rights, and everything. But they are still hammering out the finer details, the distribution of property. Everything sorted. The house has been sorted. The custody and visiting right, visitation of the children has been sorted. The car has been sorted. The finance packages, the mortgages have all been sorted. The bank accounts have been sorted. And they are now whittling down the remaining assets until they come to small things. And they're sitting there very respectfully, very cordially and calmly, husband and wife. And the inexperienced lawyers are marvelling at the fact, or those who are unaware are marvelling at the fact that they seem to be so professional, cordial and courteous and so responsible about this, so adult, so intelligent and wise. And then, when they finally come down to some of the smallest of items, and for some reason, and this is why they called it the iron factor, when it comes down to things such as the iron, for ironing clothes, a cheap item, who gets the iron? Now, they've even given away one another's children. Okay, you can have the kids, you can have the house, you can have the car. I'll take this, I'll take that. When it comes to something as lowly and as trivial as an iron, suddenly they start arguing, swearing, abusing, hurling accusations at one another. So ultimately, what it is, it's not the iron. That's, that's the final straw on the camel's back. It's not the cause, it's the catalyst. It's the final push that pushes both of them over the edge. And all that welled up anger, that frustration, all the 
bottled emotions. The iron is merely the cork that pops, and then everything bursts. That's the eruption of the volcano. So it's not the iron, it's everything. Where is the true love? If, ultimately, all they are bothered about is material possessions and self-service. And they can calmly walk away from one another and continue with their lives, as long as what they get what they want. And prenuptial agreements and court cases, where is the true love? That's because of selfishness, selfishness and greed. <coughs> I relate, I've related the story of one of my greatest teachers. I only had the opportunity of seeing him on a few occasions when he visited the country here. And I sat in his company and I also studied a few ahadith with him of Sahih al-Bukhari, we as a very large group, including our own teachers. He was such an amazing individual. Not only in terms of spirituality and piety, but piercing intelligence and wit. Truly remarkable, as well as a brilliant sense of humour. And we... When he sat there, he was suffering from cataract in his old age, and Allahu Akbar. I remember one of, his, one, of our, one of his students, who is a grand mufti in his own right, he questioned this great teacher about a fatwa, that, about a fatwa. So the student, who's a great uh, scholar in his own right, he questioned uh, the grand teacher about one masala. And he was of the opinion that the masala is different to what the Shaykh was saying. So I was sitting there, it was a Saturday afternoon, and there were a number of students, not too many. So in that late old age, without being able to read anything, and that was the same year that we stood in a number of hadith with him, the Shaykh sat there and we were sitting in the library. So he said to the questioning Mufti, he said, go and get this book. Volume this of that book. Volume such of that book. Volume this of that book. So the Mufti sat there and he's s signaling to the students. So each student would go and fetch a particular book. Then the next, then the next, then the next. And I was a, one of the younger students, so I just sat there. And before our very eyes, there now appealed, appeared a pile of books. So volume seven of a multi-volume collection, volume three of another multi-volume collection. And then the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he said to the Mufti, he said, open that book, this volume, this page, and read from the bottom half of the page. Then the Mufti would begin reading. And the Mas'ala, as the Shaykh had explained, it was the correct version, not what the Mufti had thought. Then he said, open the other book. This page, open this section, this page, read from this line. And, and he did that with a number of books. Until the Mufti said, bas bas hazrat bas bas, meaning enough, enough. And I was also fortunate in that one of the hadith that we studied with him was a hadith that I commented on some time ago, the hadith of Heraclius. So we, we studied the whole of the hadith of Heraclius with this grand sheikh. So speaking of selflessness and love, Allahu Akbar. When he got married, he had no wealth. His only wealth was a house which he had inherited. Otherwise, he used to live and teach in the madrasa. Even as a teacher, he used to stay in the madrasa. And he was so humble that rather than getting students to come and serve him, he would take his plate, and as a teacher, he would stand in the line of students waiting for food to be served to him. And he would shuffle along the line. And truly, his spirituality, his piety was astounding. He, he's a figure that all of those who have known him and sat with him and studied under him 
or even experienced a few minutes of his company, have been bowled over and overwhelmed by his spirituality and piety. All of them. Some of the greatest teachers and ulama alive today would sit in front of him like children. So this great scholar, rahimahullah, he, the day he got married, he walked into his, he walked into the house and he said to his wife on the first day, and it was an arranged marriage. They had never known one another before that. He said to her, I have no wealth in the world except this one house which I have inherited. And here you are, I have given the house to you. Consider it your mahr, your dowry, or consider it your gift. Either way, it's yours. You are now the malik and the owner and possessor. As long as you grant me permission, I will come and stay here in the house with you. If you withdraw your permission, I will quietly make my arrangements elsewhere. That is what you call selflessness. Forget giving the house after the divorce. Allahu Akbar. He gave it to her on the first night. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with such barakah that he was never short of money. And I haven't heard this from one person or two people or three people. I've heard it from a group of scholars who lived with him, who spent days and nights with him. The truth is they never knew where he got his money from. And he was known to be a bank. A bank in the sense that in the madrasa, he would stand in line with a plate waiting for food to be served to him. The one house which he had inherited, he gave away to his wife. And yet, he had no other income. He used to teach for free, only live, eat and drink in the madrasa. And yet, all the students knew that if you ever wanted a loan, and not just for to buy the next meal, if you wanted a loan to even travel for Hajj, you would go to him. And what would they, not one person, not two people, they would go for a loan. And when they would go for a loan, he would give them the loan. He'd say, come back tomorrow, come back after two days, and he'd give them the money. And then what would happen? When the time came back to pay, the students would go to pay. So he'd say, come back tomorrow, come back next week. They'd come back. They'd keep on going to him. And it would be the other way around. Normally the creditor goes to the debtor and says, pay me my money. Here, the debtor is going to the creditor and says, take back your money. And he keeps on saying, come back, come back, come back next week. Until the students would get tired and they'd, in their frustration, they would say to him, please, take the money or come to a decision. Then he would smile and say, fine, accept it as a hadiyah and a gift. And not one student, not two, countless. And one scholar who's traveled with him, who was his personal khadim, he said to me that I asked him, that what's your secret, what can you do? And he mentioned three things to me. And people regularly ask me, what are those three things? And we should ask ourselves, why do we want to know? Is it because we just want loads of money? But those three things, we can't even achieve one of them, let alone three. And if you want to know, one of those three things is, if someone comes to you for help, then help, consider their need, your need. Consider their problem, your own problem. Consider their calamity your own calamity and strive to fulfill their need and to relieve them of their suffering as you would strive to fulfill your own need and relieve yourself of your own suffering. He said, this is what I do. And that's just one of the three things. When the students heard the three things, he said, Hazrat, we can never achieve these things. So I was speaking about selfishness, even in the marital setting, even between partners and spouses. 
even those who claim to and profess to love one another, it's like, what's yours is yours, what's mine is mine. And of course they cheekily say, what's, what's mine is yours. But do they really mean it? Do we really mean it? The proof is in the pudding. The proof of love is in the giving, not just in the claim. So selfishness is a disease that afflicts us, or it afflicts every one of us, because we, we are animals, but we cannot remain animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created these characteristics in us, but we have been commanded to overcome them, and we can, but it requires sacrifice, it requires an effort, it requires work. Every human being is full of anger. The Prophet ﷺ said, he would make dua, O oh Allah, innama ana bashar. I am but a human. Aghdab kama yaghdabun. I become angry just as humans become angry. So, O oh Allah, if there is any man, any man that I have cursed or verbally abused in my anger, then make my abuse towards him a charity and forgiveness for him on the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I am but a human, I become angry just like all humans become angry. So anger is part of every human being. But aren't we required, aren't we expected, isn't it better for us to, uh, to fight that anger, to suppress that anger, to overcome that anger, to work on it, so that anger does not get the better of us. Similarly, selfishness, by virtue of, of us being animals, selfishness is our primordial instinct for survival. But we have been commanded to fight it, to overcome it, to eradicate it, to remove it from our character. Only then will we rise above the station of beasts and animals. Only then will we be considered those worthy of angelic qualities. Only then will we be close to Allah. Only then can we be truly successful. Successful of spirit, successful of the hereafter, successful in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, when we, otherwise, selfishness will destroy us. And we are selfish in many ways. We're selfish in the world. We're selfish even in deen. Even in religion, we are selfish. That may sound surprising, but subhanAllah, think of it. In religion, today's talk has been titled, Me, Myself and I, Talk on Selfishness. Because we are always consider, uh, considerate of only ourselves. We're always thinking about me, myself and I. Our conversations betray our selfishness, our egocentrism, our self-centeredness. It's all about us. When we're sitting in a gathering, if the attention is not focused on us, we burn from within. We want to be the life and soul of the party. We want everyone to look at us, be the centre of attention, be the focus, be the one that people look up to, admire, like. We want people to think good of us, that pleases our nafs. We want to be the first in everything and the centre of attention. The first in material things, the first in emotion, the first in... We want people to think of us. So we don't want them to think of anyone or anything else, we want them to be thinking of us. We want people to love us, we want to capture and enslave their minds and their hearts so that their thoughts belong to us, their emotions belong to us, their material possessions belong to us. That's what we want. We want to own everything. That's how selfish, self-centered we are. And we're never satisfied. It's not just about cars and homes and money and f food and drink and clothing and material possessions and wealth. We want to own everything. That's what the nafs is. The nafs wants to be lord. That's the diseases of the, that's the disease of the nafs. The nafs wants to be God. To own and control everything. So it's all about us, me, myself and I. Every conversation, I this, I that, me this, me that. Even in religion, 
We may think we are sincere, and we should strive to be, but sincerity is so important. Sincerity in intentions, sincerity in motive, sincerity in friendship. We've all heard the hadith. The Prophet wasallam said, Adinu nasiha. Religion is nasiha. What's nasiha? Here it doesn't mean good counsel or good advice. It means sincerity. And that's clear with the rest of the hadith. The Prophet wasallam said, Adinu nasiha. Religion is sincerity. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they said, Qalu liman ya Rasulullah, sincerity for whom? It's not advice to whom or good counsel to whom. Sincerity for whom? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li kitabihi. Sincerity to Allah. Sincerity to his messenger. Sincerity to Allah's book. And also, Sincerity to the leaders of the believers. Sincerity to the commoners amongst the believers. So this is the meaning of nasiha. Religion is nasiha, meaning sincerity. We have to be sincere in our intentions, in our motives. Sincere to the creator, sincere to the creation. Sincere to Allah, sincere to Allah's creation. Sincere to our friends. A friend in need is a friend indeed. And that can be read both ways. It's either a true maxim or it's a sar- sarcasm. When we turn to people only when we need them, that's when people say a friend in need is a friend indeed. That's sarcastic. That we only turn to one another when we can use someone, exploit them. There is no sincerity in our friendship, in our relationship. So sincerity in everything, including towards the creator as well as a creation. Now, towards the creator, we are selfish even in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may not think of it as being such. Let's ask ourselves, why do I pray? Why do I fast? Why do I go to the masjid? Why do I go for hajj? And we, we, we can ask ourselves, and we've heard the answers from others too, and we know our own answers. If you are, if you are, since, if, if you are honest in our, if we are honest in our answers, Sometimes we get the reply, I pray because it makes me feel good. I pray because Allah answers my prayers. I pray because it gives me solace and comfort. I pray because in the hustle bustle of life, it gives me a few moments of tranquility and serenity, calmness and composure. I pray because it gives me a sense of fulfillment and achievement. I fast because it makes me disciplined. I fast because it makes me do this, do that. I give wealth because it purifies my wealth. I give zakah because it purifies my wealth. It makes me feel that I can spend the rest of my wealth with a good intention, with a clear conscience. In many of our answers, it's still, even in religion, it's still about me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أقم الصلاة لذكري وأقم الصلاة لذكري And establish, in Surah Taha, and establish salah. Why? لذكري For my remembrance. When you pray, it's only for the remembrance of Allah. We pray for Allah. Fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi, Al Hadith Al Qudsi, Kullu Amal ibn Adam alahu illa siyam fa innahu li wa ana adzibih. Every deed belongs to man except fasting, for it's for me and I shall reward it. All of our acts of worship should ultimately only be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And examples of our being selfish is our behavior, even when it comes to the masjid. I apologize beforehand for saying this, but this I don't wish to berate or belittle or unnecessarily complain. I wish to address myself first and us and draw our attention to our behavior. And I've been seeing it all my life and I'm sure you can identify with it and you can recognize it. Our behavior even in the masjid. When we make our way to the masjid, we leave the house with the intention of performing salah. Now let's take the example of Jum'ah or Eid. We leave the house. We drive. We look for parking. When we arrive near the masjid, we look for parking. We don't care where we park. We violate parking regulations, which are there not for inconvenience, not for trouble. Parking regulations are there to facilitate the flow of traffic for people's convenience, for safety. But we park on double yellow lines. We violate parking regulations. We park on the pavements. We block people's path. The pavement is for walking. but We park on the pavements because that's what we want. We park on the yellow, double yellow lines, we don't care. We, we block people's entrances and exits. We block people's drives. We block other people's cars. Then we enter the masjid. We rush in. We find any spot we want. Sometimes we want to be at the front so we climb over people's shoulders and we go to the front. Prophet وسلم, in his hadith for the virtue and the reward of Jumu'ah, he promises a reward for that person who does not split two people who are sitting. I.e. they are sitting together. He does not force himself in between them, i.e. create a space by occupying a spot that he wants to at the discomfort and the inconvenience of others. Quite simply, in fact, the whole hadith speaks about not inconveniencing and troubling anyone all the way from the moment the person departs from home till the, person, till the time a person returns. We pray salah. There is no consideration for the other people praying. Then when we pray Salah, we may listen to the sermon if we arrive early enough. Do we absorb what the Imam is saying? Do we pay attention? We pray Salah. How many of us are conscious of what the Imam is reciting during the Salah? And if we understand the words, what the words mean, then as soon as Salah is finished, all we want to do is get out. See the rush after Salah. People are jostling, nudging, pushing one another. People trample over one another's shoes. When we place our shoes, we couldn't care less where we put them, as long as they are safe. People at times remove other people's shoes from the compartments and put their own in. They fling them aside. They place their shoes on others. They will walk on other people's shoes and trample on them, full of moisture and mud. But will they tolerate their own shoes? No, no. They want to wipe their shoes and place them in the corner. When we get out, we just push, nudge. It's, we just need to get out of the doors. And then we rush back to the car and we go. Our whole behavior from the moment we leave home till the moment we get back, we should ask ourselves, is it akin to, our to the behavior of someone who is sincerely, spiritually, going to a place of worship for contemplation, reflection, remembrance of the Creator, for worship, to earn reward and come back? Or is it akin to the behavior of someone going to a supermarket? This is how we behave. We go to the supermarket. We want the best parking spot. It doesn't matter if we park on the disabled bay. 
The only thing that would prevent us from parking in the disabled bay is a fear of a fire. Or the traffic ward. There was a traffic warden who... Someone left their car some time ago. It's a true story. Someone left their car. Um, and they knew that they were in an illegal parking space. So they left a message with a verse from the Bible on the wind, windscreen saying, Forgive us our trespasses. So they left a message saying, Forgive us our trespasses. They went. A traffic warden came who must have been a biblical scholar, looked at the message, slapped a ticket on, and then wrote an equal message from the Bible saying, alongside the ticket, saying, lead us not unto temptation. <laughs> so the only thing that causes us to fear, prevents us from parking in a disabled bay, is not consideration for the disabled individual but only the fear of losing money in a parking ticket. That's all. We rush in, we buy what we want, pushing our trolleys. We couldn't care if we hit someone or something. We grab what we want, look at something, place it back in another shelf, find the cheapest deal, do our shopping and get out. That's all we want. We want to get in and get out. Allahu Akbar. Let's question ourselves. Isn't that the way some of us behave when we go to the masjid? It's like, I need to pray Jumu'ah. I need to do my Eid Salah. I need to get my prayer out of the way. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, says it's makru. It's makru to eat. This is his opinion. It's makru to pray Salah whilst hungry. And therefore, you should eat first and pray later. And then he would say that I would rather make my salah, rather make my food my salah than my salah my food. Meaning, when a person's hungry, what do they do? I want to eat, so I've got to pray as well. Let me get my prayer out of the way. Let me get my prayer out of the way. So they pray first, and then quickly, and then eat at leisure. Imam, and what do they do? What in their salah, even whilst they're thinking, because they're occupied, well, they're preoccupied with hunger, they're thinking about their food. But if a person was to eat food first, they still have that worry on their head that I've got to pray my salah. So they're eating, but their thoughts are in salah. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, I would rather make my food my salah rather than my salah my food. Therefore, I eat first, quickly, get my food out of the way, and then pray to Allah at leisure. So it's like I need to get my jum'ah out of the way. I need to get my eat salah out of the way. It's just something that needs to be done for personal selfish reasons and therefore in order to achieve that it doesn't matter how many rights we violate how many others we trample over we go to the masjid in any which way we can get in do our thing get out and come back home the same we do in hajj and umrah the spectacle of people jostling fighting trampling over one another at the al-hajr al-aswad because of that selfish desire I want to be able to kiss the Al-Hajr Al-Aswad. I want to do it. I should have that opportunity. I must do it. Whatever our selfish motive. In order to kiss the Al-Hajr Al-Aswad, which is a sunnah, it's not an obligation, it's not a wajib. We commit many harams. We fight, we jostle. We push and shove women, children, old people. This leads to stampedes even around the Kaaba, only for the self-satisfaction and the smugness of having of the thought of having been able to kiss the cow, to kiss the al-Hajr al-Aswad. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu and the way he would kiss it is he'd stand over it in his unique manner, and then he'd say, "O oh stone, 
I know that you are a stone. You do not harm or benefit in any way. And if it wasn't for the fact that the Prophet ﷺ kissed you, I would never kiss you. And then he'd bend over and he'd kiss the Abu Hajr al-Aswad passionately. But it's a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's not a wajib. So even in religion, we are motivated by selfish intentions. And that selfishness is to be found everywhere, in religion, in dunya, even in dunya. We are so selfish, we are never satisfied. And as I explained right at the beginning, animals aren't greedy, they are selfish. They have an in primordial instinct for survival which drives them to be selfish. They need to eat, they will do anything to eat. But once they have eaten, their, selfishness, their selfish desire comes to an end for that period. They don't plan, they don't think to be selfish ahead. They don't harbour any selfish thoughts. Their selfishness is not coupled with malice or resentment or emotion. It's a necessity. But humans, if we need to eat, we do it. But the moment our immediate need is satisfied and fulfilled, it doesn't stop. We plan ahead. We, 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 our selfishness is coupled with emotion, with malice, with hatred, with further desire. We want more. We, ca we can't have it now, but we want it for the future. That's greed. That's a difference. Animals aren't greedy. They are selfish. Our selfishness is not immediate or merely instinctive, and it's not merely about survival. It's for hoarding. It's for accumulation. It's for gathering. It's for, it's for sinister purposes, and it's lifelong. And this is why we hoard and accumulate wealth. We are never satisfied. We are so lowly that Allah has given us so much, and yet we want the smallest things. And it's surprising. Imagine we invite 50 people. 49 of them come, one doesn't come. We, we invite 40, pe 50 pe 40 people to our house for a meal. We plan for it. We do so much. We go out of our way, we invite 40 people. 39 come, one doesn't. Our whole evening is wasted because we're there, we're surrounded by friends and family. People are smiling, enjoying company. There are 39 visitors. We're not happy about the 39 who are there. We're worried about the one who isn't there. Allah has given us so many possessions, a hundred possessions. We look around us, we've got 99 brilliant possessions. One is missing. We want one thing. We forget about the 99. We, f we are grieved and we feel a sense of loss and we are saddened by the absence of one material thing. That's greed, that's shah. We are never satisfied. In this country, only a few days ago I read an article, only a few days ago, that people in the UK, in this country, we in this country, we form, as a nation, we form the elite, the economic and financial elite of the world. And collectively, people in this country own more in assets and in wealth than 92% of the world. 92%. And the fi it, you don't have to be a millionaire. The figures, I don't know, remember the exact figures, but they were given in dollars. But the, I think the figure was approximately something like 450,000. If you own more, more than 450,000, you may think, well, I don't own more, hundred, more than 450,000. That's in total, all your assets put together. You are not in the 7% of the world's elite. You are in the 1%. If you have 
more than £450,000 approximately of assets. That includes your house, your car, your clothes, every penny that you own. You own more than 99% of the world's population. And if you own more than 100000 and I think that's in dollars, so if you own more than £55,000, you are actually within the world's 5% elite. And in this country, almost every person, unless they are totally penniless, still belongs to the world's 10% of the elite. Imagine this thought, we here, we own more than approximately six and a half to seven billion people in the world, and yet we're not happy. Allah says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ If you are grateful, I shall give you more. And if you are ungrateful, then indeed my punishment is painful. And what is that painful punishment? What is that painful punishment? If your ingratitude and if your shuh and your covetousness, your greed and your selfishness leads you to committing, committing sins, then Allah's pain will be punishing. Allah's punishment will be painful. But if we don't get rid of that shuh, and if we are ungrateful, we actually, the punishment begins within ourselves. Our greed, our selfishness in itself is painful. It's painful. Why don't we overcome it? Why don't we overcome that pain? Why not be at ease? Be grateful for what we have rather than being pain and agony for what we don't have. If we have 39 friends who turn up, be grateful for them rather than the one who's absent. If we have 99 possessions, be happy and grateful for them rather than being pain for the one that, and punish ourselves for the one that we don't have. But that's what greed does. We are, if we are selfish, if we have that shuh in us, we will never be happy. If we learn to be selfless, it's liberating. It truly is liberating. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ was. That's how the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum were. Allah, Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhum says that there was a time and he's recalling the time of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a time when we, the companions, we believed that we have no right, no greater right to a single dinar or a single dirham than any other Muslim. But now the time has come, and he was speaking then, Immediately after the time of the Prophet wasallam, imagine how 14 centuries times have changed. So he said, now a time has come when, for people, one dinar and one dirham is more important than another Muslim. One Sahabi radiallahu anhu relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a hadith of Muslim, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they were traveling when a Bedouin came. A man came and he started looking around and the, need, the reason for him looking around was that he was in need. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and then he made an announcement. And he said to the Sahaba anhum, he said, whoever has an extra ride, i.e. a camel or a horse, then let him give it away to others. Whoever has extra provision, then let him give, him give them away to others. Whoever has extra food, let him give, him give it away to others. And then he said, the Sahabi radiallahu anhu says, he continued to mention many different things of wealth, many different categories, food, provisions, dry things, horses, camels, a ride. He said, whoever, whoever has anything extra, let him give it away. Whoever has anything extra, Surplus, let him give it away. Then the Sahabi radiallahu anhu says, he said it to, to such an extent that we then began to think that we have no right in anything that we actually possess which is extra to our needs. 
Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever has extra, let him give it away, let him give it away. Rather than trying to collect and accumulate and grab as much as we can for ourselves, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, give whatever is excess. And what's excess? What's fadl? If you have food for today, they were on a journey. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you have extra provisions, extra dates, extra nuts, give them away, share them. You have a ride, you have a camel or a horse. You've got one, why do you need the other? Give it to someone else. And that's what the Sahaba radiallahu anhu used to do. They used to give. I will explain more, inshallah, after Salah. If you can bear with me, then we'll pray Maghrib Salah. And inshallah, I'll continue with, uh, not for too long, but with some very pertinent and inspiring examples of the selflessness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. So inshallah we'll continue after salah. I was speaking about the masjid earlier on in that we go to the masjid and what's our, what's our manner of going to the masjid? We end up being selfish even in religion. And I said that may sound surprising that how can we be selfish in religion? But Allah Himself explains that in the Quran. Allah says, "Women and nurse, may you abu Allah ala harf. For in asabu who khairun it ma in nabi. Wa in asabu to fit not in kalaba ala which he chaser a dunya will a hira. That like a who will chusran mubin. Allah says, There are of the people those who worship Allah upon the edge, ala harf, upon the edge. So if good fortune befalls him, then he is content. But if fitna afflicts him, if a calamity or a misfortune or a suffering befalls him, in qalab ala wajhi, he falls flat on his face, he flips on his face, i.e. he turns against Allah. He has lost the world and the life after death. This is the clear loss. What's this in relation to? Imam Bukhari relates a hadith in his Sahih and so do others. That during the time of the Prophet some Bedouin came to Medina. And they embraced Islam. They followed the Prophet and they were hoping for riches and good fortune. After some time, some of them stayed, others went back. But in both cases, when they did not see any good fortune, and it was in simple things, like some of them wanted male children, others wanted crops, others wanted pastures, others wanted camels and sheep and flocks and herds. So, and they weren't expecting these from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a gift, but their mentality was that if I believe in Allah and worship him, it would be good for me in my dunya. I'll get what I want. So after a time when they saw that they weren't getting what they wanted in terms of material wealth and possessions, they actually turned away from religion. Or they blasphemed against Allah, or some of them went to the extent of saying there's no good in this religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that people worship Allah and serve him for selfish reasons. That even in their ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal, they want some good for themselves. As long as that good comes, they are content. They are of the people, those who worship Allah upon the edge. If good befalls him, then he is content. If any misfortune befalls him, he flips on his face. And in doing so, he suffers not only the loss of the world, but he suffers a loss of the afterlife. And that is the clear loss. And undoubtedly, such Bedouin were weak of faith, and some of them may have been hypocrites. Because who, 
who would openly blaspheme against Allah in that manner in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Regardless, Allah himself states that people worship Allah for selfish reasons. We need to ask ourselves, do we belong to that category or not? I mentioned earlier about a friend in need being a friend indeed. We do that with Allah, just like we do with each other. We, we want something, we contact someone. And even they are surprised that they haven't heard from us for so long. Or we haven't heard from someone who contacts us for so long. And there's a nagging voice in the back of our minds that he or she wants something. So after the initial exchange of greetings and pleasantries, we, th we think into ourselves, well, get to the point, why have you called? Why have you contacted me? certainly isn't merely out of courtesy or inquiring of my welfare. I haven't seen you or heard from you for months, for years. And then, after the introduction and the paving and the softening and the moulding and the flattering, then the request comes. And it's always something personal and selfish. This is why we say a friend in need is a friend indeed. And we are so selfish, so exploitative, that Allahu Akbar, we use people, we exploit them, we demand favours of them, and once their usefulness has expired, we forget them, we dump them, we ignore them, we walk past them as though they never knew us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that kind of relationship as well in the Qur'an. Allah says, وَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ الضُّرَّ دَعَانَا لِجَنْبِهِ أَوْ قَاعِدًا أَوْ قَائِمًا When harm, when suffering for, befalls man, he calls out to us, لِجَنْبِهِ Lying on his side, or while seated, or while standing, meaning in all postures, at all times of the day, sitting, standing, lying, sleeping, rising, resting, Moving, it doesn't matter. When a person is suffering a misfortune, when a person wants something, either they want something, i.e. they want something good, or they want to be relieved of a suffering. People pray for exams. People pray for simple things like car tests and good qualifications and a, a good rate or pass rate in exams. Uh, a job interview, and everyone prays for marriage. And these are the good things, or success in wealth or business. And then we pray in order to be relieved of our suffering, of a calamity or misfortune. And in either case, we pray in earnest. We beg Allah, we beseech Him, we plead with Him, we shed tears. And they may be sincere, genuine tears for the time, because we, we are sincere in what we want. Even a thief is sincere. A thief is sincere and determined. So we are sincere and determined in what we want. And we may even shed genuine tears between us and our Creator. When we get what we want, success, or the relief of our suffering, then what do we do? I don't need to say it. Allah describes it. Allah says, وَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ الضُّرُّ دَعَانَا لِجَنْبِهِ أَوْ قَاعِدًا أَوْ قَائِمًا When suffering befalls man, he calls out to us whilst lying on his side, whilst seated or whilst standing. Then, فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُ الضُّرَّ Then when we relieve him of his suffering, مَرَّ كَأَلَّمْ يَدْعُنَا إِلَىٰ ضُرِّ مَسَّ He passes by as though he never called out to us for a suffering that befell him. Ever. So we treat Allah as we treat our friends, our colleagues, our acquaintances. Someone to be turned to in need, someone to be used, someone to be exploited. And the moment their usefulness expires, someone to be forgotten. So much so that Allah describes in another verse, 
وإذا أنعمنا على الإنسان أعرض ونآ بجانبه When we bestow a favor upon man, i.e. we relieve him of his suffering, we give him what he wants, he's got what he wants, what does he do? A'rad, he turns away from us. bijanibih, and he distances himself with his side. That's a literal translation. Wana'a a ba'rad bijanibih, with his side. He distances himself with his side. What's the meaning of distancing himself with his side? You have to see it. This is what it means. That's the meaning of wana'a bijanibi. That the way we do to each other as though e with great contempt. We we don't even want to be in the proximity of the person. We don't want to be seen to be associated with them. So with great contempt and disgust, the way we withdraw in our shoulders and we tuck in our arms and we distance ourselves physically, that's the actual meaning of wana'a bijanibi. So we do, Allah says, the people do that with me. We do that with Allah. So we are selfish in religion. And going back to what I was saying, that we, we have masjids. Another example of us being selfish in religion is our relationship with masjids, with charities, with religious institutions, people of religion. We all need charities. We all need masjids. We all need religious establishments. We need people of religion. We need ulama that we can turn to. We need mashaykh who can serve as our mentors, as our guides, as our teachers. We turn to them for solace, for comfort, for clarification, for explanation. We need masjids for our ibadah. We need madaris for the education of our children and for our own education for religious guidance. We need religious charities and establishments, but have we ever stopped and asked ourselves, we need these people and these establishments and these institutes when we want them. But do they just miraculously appear out of nowhere, ready? They have to come from somewhere. They have to be staffed, they have to be built, they have to be developed. These individuals need to be created. So who does that? We carry on merrily with our lives, spending on ourselves. The moment we need a place to pray, we go to the masjid. Have we ever thought about the sweat, the tears, the perspiration, the wealth that have all gone into building that masjid? And that continue to go into maintaining the masjid. Have we ever thought of that? We go in. We want the best parking spot. We want all the facilities. We want parking spaces with drawn lines. We want underfloor heating in the, in the winter. We want air conditioning in the summer. We want hot, piping hot water. We want fragrant hand washers. We want clean smelling toilets befitting five star hotels. We want all the facilities. We want plush carpets that we can sit on comfortably. We want a good sound system. Not only that, we want a good qira'ah as well. We want the best of qira'ah. <coughs> well, one of my teachers, very humorous, he He used to be an imam in, in a masjid, and eventually he resigned because the congregation, and more so the committee, kept on pestering him. They wanted him to recite long surahs. So when he resigned, he argued with them, and he was quite forceful, and he said to him, you pay me absolute peanuts. He spoke in our language. And the equivalent is, he didn't use the word peanuts, it's an English phrase, but he, the equivalent in our language is, you pay me peanuts and you expect me to rip my throat like Qari Abdul Basit. And there was another story, I don't know whether this is actually a true or just a joke, but what a committee member told me this story. He said, you know, uh, there was an imam who every salah he used to recite, 
قل هو الله أحد إنا أعطيناك الكوثر والعصر So the committee kept on bothering him and saying, why don't you recite longer surahs, longer surahs? So eventually he got fed up and one day he said to them, Jesse, <laughs> that the, the surah is proportionate to the wage. You pay me an absolute minimum wage, you get minimum surahs. As the wage, accordingly the surah. So we want the best. We want the imam to give us a melodious recitation over a brilliant sound system. Who pays for all this? And it's not just about money. People volunteer. They volunteer to clean the masjid, to pay, to run the masjid. Allahu Akbar. Normally in most masjids you will find one devoted individual who acts as a caretaker voluntarily. They come and they look after the whole masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa honored those who honored the masjid. When he didn't just say build the masjid and collect funds and give a contract. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told the sahaba radiyallahu anhum let's build the masjid. And then he himself participated. So that he carried bricks until his body was covered in dust. So we want the best of religious establishments and people, but we make no contribution whatsoever. And one thing I would like to make clear, anything I say today is not about monetary contribution. Because we're not just interested in money. Money is not going to solve the problem of selfishness. And this leads me to the next thing. Next thing. Like I said, we need madaris, we need Islamic schools, we need religious establishments and charities, we need religious people. But just as they are making their contribution mon monetarily, financially, in terms of time, volunteering their charity, we need to do the same. We need to volunteer our time. We need to be less selfish and more selfless with what we love. We all want our free time, our food, our drink, our rest, our sleep, our privacy. Well, are, are we the only ones entitled to that? Wallahi, if everyone thought the same, if everyone valued their privacy like we value our privacy, if everyone guarded their wealth like we guard our wealth, and like I said, today is not about wealth, but if everyone guarded their privacy like we guard our privacy, if everyone treasured their emotions like we treasure our emotions. If everyone was as selfish as we are with our time, our wealth, our emotions, our privacy, our leisure, then there'd be no masjids, no religious schools, no establishments, no charities, no people that we could ever turn to at our time of need. That's a fact. So we need to break out of this mold. We need to become selfless and charitable. So the question is, and I'll end with this, how do we do that? How do we become charitable? How do we become selfless? How do we rid ourselves of this disease of selfishness, which is destructive? Both in the dunya and in the akhirah. Even in the dunya, ultimately, nobody likes vultures. Nobody likes hyenas. Why? Hyenas are scavengers. Hyenas have some certain qualities. They have strength. A hyena's jaw is unbelievably strong. And their teeth. A hyena can take a bottle, crush it with jaws and teeth, and the glass does not affect the hyena. Vultures, buzzards, they have their own qualities. Yet, does anyone admire a buzzard? Does anyone like a buzzard, a vulture, or a hyena? No. We hold them in contempt. Animals loathe them. Even in the animal kingdom, there's respect between animals. So people respect a lion, people will respect, sorry, not people, animals will respect a lion, not just fear it. Animals will respect an elephant. 
But the animal kingdom loathes buzzards, vultures and hyenas. Why? Because they are scavengers. Even animals don't like scavengers. So what are human beings? Those who are selfish and who act in that selfish, exploitative manner, who scavenge, who don't want to carry any weight, who don't want to carry any burden, who don't wish to make any contribution, but wish to live of the fruits of other people's labour and other people's efforts. They are, how do we treat them? How do we view them? People view them as scavengers, as vultures, as hyenas. So it's a despicable trait. So how do we, even in worldly terms, selfishness doesn't make sense. Altruism makes sense. And in Islam, how do we attain that lofty grade of selflessness so that we can liberate ourselves, rise above that lowly bestial station and become beloved to Allah? How can we achieve that self selflessness which makes us better people, of better minds, of better spirits, of better hearts, bring us, brings us closer to Allah and makes Allah pleased with us? How do we do that? One simple solution. One. Allah says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّ You will never attain virtue, righteousness, until you spend of that which you love. Allah says in another verse, وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ That he gives of his wealth despite the love of that wealth. And then Allah mentions the categories of expenditure. It's a verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. So, this is the solution. We force ourselves. No amount of speech, no number of speeches, no amount of talk, no amount of advice is going to change us for us. We have to introduce that change ourselves. We have to go through individual therapy. We have to make choices, decisions, and perform actions which change <coughs> us. Words alone aren't sufficient. So, what's the solution? You spend of that which you love. Allah says, you, sp you will never attain virtue until you spend of that which you love. And as I said today, it's not about spending money. That's part of it. Whatever we love, we have to be willing to sacrifice it. And we have to make sacrifices. We love our free time. We have to learn to be charitable with our free time. We all want to be leisurely, but we have to learn to be charitable and to make sacrifices of our leisure. We all want our privacy, but we have to learn to open up, open up our hearts, our minds, our time, and our homes. We have to learn to share, share our thoughts, our emotions, our being, our privacy, our leisure, our time, our comforts, and our wealth. It's only when we force ourselves to do these things that we will become selfless like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And their example is perfect. When this verse was revealed, one after the other, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they made a demonstration of their selflessness and of actually working on themselves to act on this verse. The most famous incident is that of Abu Talha radiallahu an. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, who says that his stepfather Abu Talha al Ansari radiallahu an, he was the richest of the, he was one of the richest and the wealthiest of all the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in terms of owning palm groves, orchards, whole palm groves, not one palm tree, but whole palm groves. Gardens upon gardens. He had many all scattered all across Medina. And when this verse was revealed, he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah says, You will never attain piety until you spend of that which you love. So I have reviewed my wealth. And of all my wealth, there is one garden which is the most beloved to me. And it was Bayruha. It, was, it actually had a name, Bayruha. It was actually opposite the masjid. And it was such a beautiful place. It had palm groves, a place to sit, a well. 
The Prophet وسلم, used to regularly go there, rest under the shade and drink from the water of the well. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, of all my wealth, Bayruha is the most beloved plot of land to me. And I have decided, in order to act on this verse, that I give it in the way of Allah. So he gave the garden away in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have been given a plot of land in the fertile, rich oasis of Khaybar. That he got that as a share. He said, that is the most beloved of all land to me. And our messenger of Allah, I wish to give that in the way of Allah. What shall I do with it? He said, what shall I do with it? So the Prophet ﷺ said, keep the land. I don't, don't just give it away. Keep the land. But all the produce, give it in the way of Allah. So make it waqf, a religious endowment. So that's what Umar ibn al-Khattab said. This is given to as a waqf, as a religious endowment. So it remained in his name, but it was given away. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu anhu. His son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, he was the same. He would actually, he would sit down and he would think as to what wealth do I love? Which wealth do I love? And whatever he loved, he sacrificed. He was once riding a camel. And he purchased it with great wealth. And he really liked it. The moment he liked it, he got off. And he said to his attendant, Nafi'i, he said, remove the saddle and go and sell this camel. So he said to him, but you spent so much wealth on it. He said, go and sell it. This is why. Because he loved it. He wanted to act on the verse, spend of that which you love. Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu anhu that one time adopted son of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, when this verse was revealed, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is my horse. And this horse he had was the most beloved horse to him. It was more his most beloved possession. So he said, a messenger of Allah, I wish to give this in the way of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted it. He gave it away in in the way of Allah. And then something remarkable happened. He was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's one time adopted son. And his his son was Usama ibn Zayd, who was a beloved of the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam straight away took Usama and put him on the horse. He said, You climb. You climb the horse. So Usama sat down. Straight away Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu and his face dropped. So the Prophet وسلم, looked at him and when he saw his face dropping, he said, Allah has accepted your charity, O Zayd. What does that mean? Meaning Allahu Akbar. Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu anh, went to the Prophet وسلم, with the intention that this horse is the most beloved animal to me. I wish to sacrifice it and spend it in the way of Allah so that I may attain that virtue that Allah promises in the verse. But when the Prophet وسلم, accepted the sadaqah and placed Usama on it, Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu anhu feared that my son, I fear that maybe my son being on the horse or my son being given the horse will reduce my reward and will cancel my sacrifice. That's what he feared. And that's why his face dropped. So the Prophet wasallam reassured him that don't worry, O Zayd, Allah has accepted your charity and sacrifice. That's how the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were. That's how the Prophet wasallam was. To give of that which you love. He once came out, a woman came to him with a cloak, what we call a chadr, or a shamla, a burda, a, a kind of blankets that you wrap, a shawl. So she gave it to him as a gift. It was a very beautiful one. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commenting on it. It's so good. And he really liked it. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum liked it. Straight away a man spoke up and said, Ya Rasulullah, it's a very nice one. Give it to me to wear. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum rebuked him and said, you have burden. He went inside and he, the Prophet sallallahu went inside in order to remove it and come out and give it to him. 
So they said to him, you burden the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he said, look, I only did that so that the cloak of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam could become my guffin and shroud. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came out and gave it to him and indeed he gave instructions and when he died he was buried in that same shroud. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave it away. To give of that which you love. And it's not just about wealth, it's about... Abdullah, I was saying about Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma. I went on to Zayd ibn Harith. Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, he would look at what he loved. He would think and then he'd spend it. He gave a camel away. He gave wealth away. It's said about Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, that on some occasions, in one single gathering, he would give away 30,000 dirhams. 30,000 dirhams. On one occasion, he was ill. So he wanted dates. So he said, get me dates. So he, they sent someone, his wife sent someone, with one dirham to get a bunch of grapes. And I was just thinking that, SubhanAllah, even today, one bunch of grapes, how much are they? About two pounds? One large <coughs> bunch of grapes. So, right, inflation's correct. It was the same price then. One bunch of grapes, unqood bi dirham, with one dirham. One dirham, I'm not sure of the price right now, but as I've mentioned before, it was close to two pounds. So, someone went and got one bunch of grapes. So as he was returning from the market with a bunch of grapes, a beggar saw the bunch of grapes and he followed the purchaser. When he arrived, they brought the grapes in and the beggar said, I am in need. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah said, give the dates to him. So his wife then gave another dirham and said, go and purchase another bunch of grapes. <coughs> and he was ill. Abdullah ibn Umar was ill. So he went and got another bunch of grapes. When he came back, another beggar followed him. And as soon as he arrived, he said, I'm in need. Abdullah ibn Umar said, give them to him. So then his wife scolded the person and said, look, he will never be able to eat. So go and fetch grapes and give them to him. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu once he was traveling and he really wanted to eat fish. So wherever he stopped, they searched for fish. There was none available except one. In that whole area, only one fish was available. So his wife purchased, purchased the fish. His wife took great care. This is Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, took great care in cooking the fish. She cooked it, prepared it, presented to Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma when a man came to the door. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma said, give him the dish. So his wife said, we can give him money. You eat this, we can give him money. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma said, no, give him this. She said, you wanted fish. You wanted fish. So now you have it. Give him money instead. So Abdullah ibn Umar anhu said, no, give him this. She protested. So he said, this is what my heart wants. This is what I want. If you want what I want, respect my decision. This is what I want. Give him the fish. And it's not just about fish. It's about sacrificing what you want and what you love about selflessness. And there are countless stories of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I'll end with just two stories. In fact, you know how selfless the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Ansar, today we have refugees traveling everywhere. There's a refugee crisis in Europe. There are refugees arriving in many countries from war-torn areas. These, they are shunned, abused, downtrodden, refused. And we all know of the refugee crisis. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they traveled from Mecca to Medina and they emigrated, 
In a way, they were refugees. They fled Mecca and took refuge in Medina because of persecution. How did the Ansar receive them? Well, do you know one hadith is? The Ansar went to the Prophet وسلم, and said to the Prophet وسلم, Ya Rasulullah, it's a hadith of Bukhari, Ya Rasulullah, we have our wealth, our orchards, our palm groves. We want you to divide all our wealth and give half of it to the, to the Muhajirun. So the Prophet ﷺ had to refuse. He said, no. They were the ones asking that you divide our wealth and give it to the Muhajirun. And the Prophet ﷺ was the one who said, no. He said, rather, it's better that you keep your wealth, they assist you, they do the work, and you share the profits. So then the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, both the Ansar and the Muhajirun agreed. That's, that's selflessness. That's how the Sahaba were. And I'll relate just two stories of selflessness and I'll end with these. Allah says, You will never attain piety, virtue, until you spend of that which you love. Bukhari and Muslim both relate a hadith from Anas bin Malik who says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه One of you cannot become a true believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. And that's how the Sahaba were. And we need to adopt their example. Even if we, of course, we will never be able to achieve what they achieved. But as long as we can become less selfish, less self-centered, less egocentric, Less concerned about myself, less concerned about me, myself and I. And open up our hearts and minds. We will achieve much. We will achieve the liberation of the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit. We will attain virtue and piety and we will attain true belief. So the two stories with which I end are, one Abu Talha al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu, again Imam Bukhari and others Muslim, all relate that one night the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up because a guest came to him, and that guest appears to be Abu Hurairah radiyallahu an. Abu Hurairah radiyallahu an went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, I am hungry and in need. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stood up and he said, who will... Before he made an announcement, do you know what he did? He didn't expect anyone else to be charitable. He sent a messenger to his wives. Every wife sent back the message with the messenger saying, Give our salam to the Messenger of Allah and inform him that we have no food in the house except water. All of the wives. This was in the days when the Muslims were suffering. So the Prophet ﷺ stood up only when he had nothing to feed the guest himself. And he said, who will entertain the guest of the Messenger of Allah? So one of the Sahaba, one of the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhum stood up and he said, I will, O Messenger of Allah. <coughs> he didn't call home to inquire first. He just said, I will. So he took the guest. After he reached home, he said to his wife, do you have any food? She said, I've got enough for the children. So he said, put the children to sleep. Now, it doesn't mean that the children starved. Because what it is, you know how, imagine the father arrives at home and he says, that, is there any food? And the wife says, the mother of the children says, there is some, but it's for the children. Meaning, it's specially for the children. So it doesn't mean that they are hungry and they are starving. It may be at night, but how mothers tend to keep food only for the children parents will do but children so that's how it was it wasn't that the children starved so he said well put the children to sleep the children, and he said to her put the children to sleep dim the lamp put out the food for our guest so the children were put to sleep the lamp was dimmed and the husband and wife pretended to eat that's why they dimmed the lamp so that the guests couldn't tell that they weren't eating. So they pretended to eat. 
But all the food that was available, they gave it to the guest. And who was the guest? Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. Yeah. Next morning, when this Sahabi radiallahu anh, went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah marveled and smiled at what you and your family did last night. And Allah revealed this verse. In your in relation to you and part of the verse was and they give privilege and preference to others over themselves even though they may be in need and whoever is protected from the avarice and greed of his soul these are the ones who are successful and the other example and story which I end with and this is it it's not about money it's about giving of time. And the story is of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. When he was Amir al-Mu'mineen, he, was, he used to patrol Medina at night, the streets. So one night he came out and he saw a tent pitched in an open area. So he went to check, what's this? There was a Bedouin sitting outside. He was obviously from out of the city. So he said to him, who are you? And when he arrived, he, he heard some groaning sounds from inside the tent. So it was obviously a sound of pain. So he said to the Bedouin, what's this? So the Bedouin said to him, he didn't know who he was, he didn't recognize him. So he said to him, please brother, mind your own business. And then he said, why have you come? So he said, I have come to see Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab because I am in need. So he said, look, brother, he persisted, tell me, what, what, what's the sound? So he said, my wife is in labor. So he said, wait here. He went home. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he's the leader of the faithful. He's the Amir of the Muslims. He's the governor, the commander, the ruler, the uncrowned king. He goes home and he tells his wife, Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha, the daughter of Fatima radiallahu anha. The daughter of Ali radiallahu So he says to him that, he says to her, gather, and she was young, he says to her, gather some pots, utensils, and cooking items, and come, and he explained that there is someone in need, and his wife's in labor. Husband and wife, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, and Umm Kulthum, they gathered, Pots, utensils, and food stuff. And Umar radiallahu anh carried it on his back. And they went. They set up the cauldron outside the tent. Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha went inside. And she began attending to the lady in labor. And Umar radiallahu anh sat outside, cooking food, and in one narration with the smoke rising and wafting through his dense beard. And that was Amir al Mu'minin. He cooked food. And this was at night, late at night, when Medina was asleep. And then after the food was cooked, well, he was carrying, he was cooking the food, when suddenly Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha popped her head out of the tent and she said, O oh, Amir al Mu'minin, give glad tidings to your friend. That's when the Bedouin was startled. He said, Amir al Mu'minin. So Umar radiallahu anh said to him, look, do not fear, do not worry. It doesn't change anything. He said, come to me tomorrow morning. And then they ate, they fed the family, and give glad tidings to your friend of the birth of a son. And that's when he was startled. They fed, they wrapped up. Next morning, the Bedouin came, Umar radiallahu anh gave him foodstuffs and equipment and wealth. And the Bedouin then stayed for a while and returned. The moral of the story is Umar radiallahu and being Amir al Mu'mineen, see how he gave of his time, his leisure. He wasn't selfish. And that's a lesson to be drawn. I end with this. I, who would do that? Who amongst us would do that? Going out to help someone in need. Everyone turns away. Allahu Akbar. Because we're all worried about ourselves. We have everything. But we're just worried about ourselves. Because we want more. If we've got our food and drink and our leisure and accommodation, we want our privacy, our entertainment, our pastime. We don't want that to be affected. 
we need to learn to volunteer, to share. And the way of doing this is forcing ourselves to sacrifice of that which we love. We love our time, we love our wealth, our privacy, our entertainment, our leisure. We should be willing to sacrifice these things. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to understand. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiraku wa natubu ilayhi.